Hello, and welcome to the second session of today's McKnight's online forum. This session is entitled Indoor Environmental Quality and Senior Health. I'm Lois Bowers, editor of McKnight Senior Living, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of McKnight Senior Living, McKnight's Long-Term Care News, and McKnight's Home Care. What surrounds us, particularly our indoor environments, can significantly affect our health and well-being. This is especially true for older adults. In a moment, collaborators of the WISE initiative, WISE stands for Wellness Innovation in Senior Environments, will discuss how improving indoor environmental quality can enhance senior living communities. Today, you're going to learn how indoor air quality and other factors play essential roles in the vitality of older adults, indoor environmental enhancements that can help reduce stress and promote overall well-being, and how healthier indoor spaces can benefit both seniors and caregivers. You'll meet our panelists in a moment, but first we have some housekeeping matters to attend to. First, we won't have any slides for you to download for this session because we'll be having a conversation. Next, if you're having any audio problems with this broadcast, please first check the volume control on your device. This is the most common cause of hearing issues. The sound should be coming from your computer speakers. Also, we will have time for questions and answers near the end of today's discussion. If you have any questions about the information pre presented, please feel free to send them directly to us anytime during this hour by clicking on the questions and answers tab on the left. Questions that we don't get to in real time will be answered afterward. Today's program is made possible by support from Delos. After this webinar, you can visit the company website at delos.com. This educational offering has been reviewed by the National Continuing Education Review Service of the National Association of Long-Term Care Administrator Boards and has been approved for one clock hour. You must stay tuned to this event in its entirety during the original broadcast to receive a certificate. And each attendee must sign in and listen on a separate computer. Attendees can track CE requirements through the course completion tracker, which is accessed through the last icon in the area below the open webinar panel. Once you have achieved 50 viewing minutes, a view certificate button will display and the review, required reviewing duration will have a green checkbox. You then can view and save your certificate. A copy also will be emailed to you afterward. And now I'd like to welcome our panelists for today's discussion on indoor environmental quality and senior health. When smoke and pollution foul the air, most people seek relief indoors, but indoor air quality can often be worse, up to five times worse actually, than outdoors. This can significantly affect our health and well-being. As I mentioned, our panelists are part of a research collaboration called the Wellness Innovation in Senior Environments Initiative, or WISE, which is focused on how indoor environments affect older adults. Today, we're going to be talking about how improving indoor environmental quality can enhance senior living communities, and we'll discuss the effects of specific elements such as indoor air quality, lighting, and other design and operational factors on older adult health and well-being. Allow me to introduce our panelists. Peter Schala is President and Chief Operating Officer of Delos, a company focused on improving indoor environments. Delos leverages more than a decade of scientific research conducted by Delos Labs and the Well Living Lab, which is a Delos collaboration with the Mayo Clinic, and applies an evidence-based approach to innovation for healthier buildings. Rick Matros is President, CEO, and Chair of Sabra Healthcare REIT, a California-based real estate investment trust that invests in senior living, skilled nursing, behavioral health, and other property types. Kevin Mazurek, PhD, is a research scientist at the Well Living Lab with a focus on electrical engineering and neuroscience. He also is an adjunct assistant professor in the Mayo Clinic Department of Physiology and Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Mazurek earned his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Brown University and his master's degree and PhD in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins University. His research combines engineering development with neurophysiological neurophys outcomes in an effort to better understand how to improve the health and well being of older adults. Before we get started, I'd like to set the stage a bit more. 
Many today's older adults are baby boomers, the oldest of which were born in 1946, making them 76 years old. The oldest baby boomers are turning 58 this year, so they're too young for many senior living communities right now, but the entire baby boom generation will be 65 years old or older by 2030. The generation spans 18 years, but generally speaking, this generation has been more health conscious than previous generations. Today's panelists will discuss how what surrounds us, where we live and spend our time can affect health and well-being. So let me start with a question to Peter Shala. Peter, through your work, you're familiar with the range of business sectors from schools to office buildings to residences. One of your main areas of focus is senior living though. Why is indoor environmental health of particular importance for older adults, their families and caregivers? Well, thank you, Lois, for the question and uh, real pleasure to be with my fellow panelists and uh, and everybody uh, today. Uh, correct, as you mentioned, we've done a lot of work in many different sectors, um, spanning just about every major real estate sector in the world uh, and have touched um, uh, you know, business relationships in over 110 countries. Uh, this is this is a very very interesting topic for us because we feel that look, wellness is important at all ages, um, and as we age, our bodies become less able to fight off illnesses. Um, they're more sensitive to stress uh, stresses such as pathogens, uh, contaminants. Uh, of course, susceptibility to uh, to disease increases as you age. Um, we have found that just about every metric that affects a human body affects the elderly even more. Um, knowing that indoor air quality is one of the most significant factors of creating a healthy indoor environment, uh, as you noted, Lois, indoor air can be up to five times worse than, than outdoor air, and people are spending over 90% of their time indoors, right? So the combination of these two, um, on top of the, the fact that it's more important than ever to ensure that indoor environments are safe and promote well-being, uh, has, has led to our focus on this sector. Uh, I believe it's an area of high public concern, certainly an area of susceptibility. And accordingly, we've shaped our research agenda and our investment uh, into uh, separating fact from fiction and finding answers to really drive uh, the, uh, the, the the betterment of, of indoor spaces for, for aged care. Um, you know, in summary, of course, there's also an ethical imperative to improve the health and well-being of residents and staff, um, which which just creates a, ca a powerful case for us to continue to make the senior living sector a major focus of ours. Could you define what constitutes a healthy indoor environment, and could you discuss the reasons behind the founding of the Well Living Lab? It certainly will. Uh, yeah, look, um, you know, the the indoor environment is filled with things that. Uh, are becoming more common knowledge to, to, to mainstream public as it relates to their effect on the human body, on productivity, on sleeping pattern. Um, and, uh, you know, this, 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 this points to the, to the obvious ones, right? Air quality, water quality, things that we consume into our body, um, but also lighting, you know, as, as a form of consumption. Uh, our eyes are not just vehicles for, for seeing. They're also instruments to tell our body what time of day it is, depending on the nature of the light that's coming into our eye, the angle, the lux, the hue. And so light has a profound impact on sleep, um, on productivity, on performance, on longevity. Uh, and if you cover the major buckets of air, light, and water, uh, there is a wealth of uh, interventions uh, beyond that. Um, how does noise affect the stress levels in your body? Of course, ambient sound levels, you know, really do play a major role. Uh, there are so many other things that can be done indoors. Um, the major categories we've identified, but even connection to nature and green walls, um, the types of uh, furniture and, and materials that are being chosen indoor, do they off gas, do they off gas or not? Um, many, many of these things. And that, that whole body of work really points to some primary categories, but a plethora of additional ways to intervene uh, because of the effect the indoor environment is having on the body. Um, the, the, the indoor air quality is also impacted by outdoors, right? Vehicle exhaust, industrial emissions, dust, pollen, pesticides. So when you think about the combination of pollutants outdoors plus the pollutants that can be created indoors, air remains a major focus of ours. Um, and as we learn from the pandemic, which it really has been an ignition switch to raise and heighten the awareness surrounding these factors, um, you know, transmission of airborne disease. Uh, we know, uh, scientifically proven, uh, that um, COVID and other viral transmissions happen through aerosolized particles uh, and air quality and air quality measures to improve filtration and ventilation 
can go a very long way in reducing that risk. We founded the Well Living Lab. Delos and Mayo collaborated to, to, to found the lab in 2015. Uh, and this was a facility built with a purpose and a mission um, to become the world's first laboratory focused exclusively on the effect that the indoor environment is having on human bodies. Um, health, well-being, productivity, longevity, all of these things can be measured and all of the indoor in environmental interventions can be measured as well. So drawing correlations between those two was the purpose of the lab and it was the first of its kind. Uh, we look forward to continuing to advance the research agenda behind it. Thank you, Lois. Thank you. And now a question for Dr. Mazurik. Um, doctor, what does science tell us about healthy indoor environments and what are you currently researching? Yeah, this is a this is a very good question. Um, and as, as Peter mentioned, we spend 90% of our time indoors and that's data that's coming from the EPA where they looked at just how, where are we spending our time? And when you think about historically where we've been before there were indoors, we were outside a lot. And so a lot of what we're trying to look at is now, what is it that we've kind of constructed in our indoor environments and what is that doing to our general health and, and well-being and when i say our a lot of our studies are looking at younger adults middle-aged adults and older adults but for this um for the senior living population we really want to understand what is going on in older senior living facilities that really could be done to to improve their health and well-being and so we're not the only one studying this um, there are numerous studies out there that are looking at several different features of the indoor environment and how it affects health and well-being. So air quality is vitally important in looking at just airborne uh, transmission of diseases and how that really affects um, older adults where they're living. But in addition, there's so many other sensory information that we use and that really affects us. And lighting is one of them, visual senses, auditory senses, and each of these can really be looked at in the framework of senior living facilities with the idea of, is there something that, be, that can be done to really promote just healthier lifestyles for older adults? Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a coined phrase in the field called brain health or brain and cognitive health, which is really looking at what are different activities or lifestyle behaviors that older adults can do when they get older, just to improve their healthy aging and their outcomes. And so some of these are sleeping better, staying mentally active, staying socially engaged, um, being physically active, um, and nutrition. And there's just so many things that can be done just from a lifestyle's perspective that really can be, can be helpful to just improve the health and well-being of older adults. Um, what we are actively doing right now in the Well Living Lab, we're planning a study to really focus on lighting. So we picked one kind of specific uh, um, feature and really try and get to understand what is lighting doing to a lot of these health-related measures. Um, there's a lot of literature out there, a lot of researchers out there that are really looking at if you experience different colors of light, so different um, brightnesses of light at different times of the day, what does that do to these different measures of, of brain and cognitive health? So if you experience more blue light in the morning and less blue light in the evening, that's been shown to have really a, a strong effect on your sleep quality, which is important for older adults. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to look at right now is what can be done in senior living facilities that might be able to very easily improve uh, the residents' health and well-being, but not require a, a huge burden of doing massive reconstruction to get there. What does research show about how older adults respond to indoor environmental influences? Um, is that response different from that of younger adults and children? Yeah, so that's another great question because a lot of what has been often looked at for just indoor environmental quality and, and the features of what's um, what affects people is sometimes looked at that, that age range of 35 to 50 office worker. Uh, and so, it doesn't always take into consideration as people age, they truly experience their environments differently. Um, so again, using lighting as an example, um, as we age, um, older adults tend to perceive the brightness of a light differently than a younger adult. So a light might appear really bright to a younger individual, but for an older person, it might appear less bright. And so this has huge implications, both from just being able to see and navigate a room. They just, more light is needed. Um, but in addition, when trying to think about kind of these lighting therapies that are out there and trying to 
have a lot of blue light or a lot of illuminance at certain areas, if they're not perceiving it, the effect might not be what is really intended when, when designing those things. And so what we're really trying to look at here is, is it's designing studies to truly understand how do older adults perceive their environment? Um, and what is it that's kind of different than what we're finding in the lab? And we really want to get to the idea of what is a healthy indoor environment for older adults to truly kind of have these positive benefits towards their health and well-being. Okay. And now a question for Rick. Uh, Rick, Sabra has hundreds of senior living communities and nursing homes in its portfolio. What prompted you to commit so much time and so many resources to better understanding indoor health and wellness? Well, to start with, it really started with our ESG initiatives um, going back a couple of years. And um, we started looking at a lot of different products that would, could be helpful to our tenants, um, our operators, uh, to improve the quality of life within their facilities, both for residents, patients, and for staff. Um, but it was like there's so many products out there, it was like going down a rabbit hole. Um, and it's not our level of expertise. And so um, this created a really unique opportunity for us to partner with an organization, Delos, and, and the, the uh, venture that they have with Mayo to bring expertise that we can't touch um, to the fore uh, for us. We have challenges as a REIT um, because the majority of our portfolio is triple net. Um, and so in that scenario, you don't have necessarily direct control over um, over the operations um, of the facilities. So on the other hand, we bring operational expertise, we provide advice and resources, um, and we're a sounding board, um, and, um, and we relate to each other all really well. And so we felt like if we could, if we could um, get together with a really credible organization that's focused on areas that not only we don't have the expertise for, but our operators don't have the expertise. Um, and in this case, we have a facility that's really being used as a living lab, that we could use that as an example of the data that that generates, we can then share um, with our other operators. Um, we're in the habit of, of sharing best practices, and this is clearly, obviously, a best practice. So, um, so the idea is to come up with um, an experience and data that um, has real time and real life application um, that will easily be understood uh, by our operators. And why did you decide to join in on the research effort through the WISE initiative? I know this is still very, very early stage, um, but what do you hope to learn that will benefit senior living operators and residents and your business? Well, I, a couple of things. One, obviously, um, the, the DNA there is fantastic. So, um, and there just aren't organizations out there that are doing what Delos is doing and certainly not doing in, in senior living. Um, senior living tends to get sort of pushed to the side with a lot of initiatives, whether those initiatives are techni uh, technological or quality of life or whatever. Um, and um, our facilities and, and in the industry generally, most of these facilities are decades old. And so there's a lot of outmoded systems and the investment hasn't always been prioritized the same way. When people think about quality of life, they don't think about the indoor environment and, the, and air quality and how green the environment is. And, and as Peter talked about, even the furniture that you select, they don't think about that. They think about um, when it comes to residents and uh, patients, they think about how they're doing physically and how they can improve quality from a physical perspective. Um, but that's usually therapy and medicinal and things like that. Um, and um, this just doesn't, this just hasn't entered into sort of the consciousness uh, of most operators. But when you start talking about it with them intuitively, they recognize that it is an issue. And, and certainly with capital investment over the years, HVAC systems are upgraded and lighting is upgraded. And again, similar to my earlier comment, there are so many different kind of products out there um, that it's hard for people to understand what would best serve the communities um, that they're in. Yeah, Rick, if I may follow that point, excellent. Um, and, and by the way, truly commend Sabra as an organization for their leadership in this regard. Um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I think some of the opportunities we made is that the, 
there, there needs to be increased scrutiny on the um, quality of claims being made by manufacturers, whether it's air, light, water, or otherwise. Uh, and uh, the move towards wellness created a rush uh, from you know commerce to, to, to fill those needs and, and try to provide solutions. But that also created risks in that you know, you have to validate claims that are being made. It's more important now than ever, but um, yeah, I wanted to add that point as it relates to the rainbow of product solutions out there. It's a maze, it's very confusing, uh, and it's very important to, to rest on science and rec rest on facts in, in driving appropriate decisions for these interventions. And, and Thank Peter's you for point that. on the pandemic, I think, it's, I think Peter's point on the pandemic is critical because the pandemic accelerated so many trends. And, um, and it brought to bear so many of the inequities in our system across all sorts of things, right? And, and so um, I actually believe that in the absence of the pandemic, we wouldn't be as focused as we are and as Delos would be, but I'm not sure that some of the rest of us would be. And so, um, you know, it's always important, I think, when you go through periods of crisis to focus on the opportunities and the positives that can come out of that crisis um, you know, relative to doing a better job and making sure you're better prepared down the road for things that could happen. Since we're talking about the pandemic, that uh, one question I had, you had mentioned it, Rick, and Peter, you had mentioned it before. I was wondering if all of you maybe could talk about um, how the pandemic maybe has has changed this initiative or how it could change this initiative? What kind of lessons are there from the pandemic uh, regarding wellness? Uh, maybe I'll jump in uh, first I'll, on I'll, that I'll one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead, Peter, go ahead. Um, go okay, uh, sorry for a small delay there. Um, yeah, look, I mean, many lessons in the pandemic. We just touched on, you know, the the increased need for validation of, of any claims coming from manufacturers. Um, I, I think what we also found uh, during this time period is is the, the heightened awareness around the effect that indoor environment has on our, our bodies is, as Rick said, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, 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 to focus on driving progress, driving change and implementing those changes. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was struck um, when we did a lot of, of, of work and had a lot of conversations in the senior space with just how important it is to, to remember that the pandemic and health and well-being more broadly is, is not just about the residents of these occupied spaces, but also about the staff, uh, the employees that are the caregivers. Um, you know, they're spending all of their time uh, in these spaces as well. Uh, and so, you know, creating environments uh, to to address the health and well-being, not just of occupants and residents, but of course, the staff and caregivers is immensely important. And, and that's something that, you know, I think uh, is being put front and center now. And we'll speak in a minute about some of those trends, but uh, those are some observations I'd offer. Yeah, and, and sort of to add on to that, um, and really on the, on the workforce, um, the quality of life issues and needs that arose throughout the pandemic, um, were quite applicable, obviously, to um, all the people that actually work in the facilities. We've got huge shortages now. And, um, and and typically, when people think about staffing issues and what to do about it, the first thing they look at is their wages. Are they being competitive in the market and all that? They don't really think about um, the physical environment and how that may affect it. The better operators start focusing on culture. Um, but even culture doesn't necessarily touch the physical environment. Uh, and so, there's nobody that the patient or the resident spends more time with than the staff and the facilities. And so regardless of how much family involvement there is, so to create an environment or to improve an environment so that it provides better quality of life for the staff has a direct impact on the benefits of the quality of life for the residents and the patients. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Mazurik, I understand that why the WISE initiative research is conducted in environments that mimic the conditions of senior living, as well as on-site actual long-term care facilities. Um, what can you learn by conducting research on-site versus in a lab setting? 
Yeah, this is a, a this is a good question that we always try and look at in terms of what do we do in our lab versus what do we do when we go out into the community. Um, for kind of a background on the Well Living Lab, um, our space is very reconfigurable, so we can build out lab settings that look like studio apartments, or they can look like office spaces, or they can look like classrooms, or they can look like the residences that you would find in a senior living facility, and so what this allows us to do is to really be able to control a lot about what we are trying to kind of focus on or study in our research experiments so in the lab we can use several different types of non-intrusive or non-invasive sensors whether it's watches or whether it's just devices that are actually built into the space to monitor where people are going or what they're doing and it really gives us the a lot of data to be able to characterize what a person experiences and how it relates to either their stress levels, their physical activity, their cognitive performance. And we get a lot of information out of that. Now, the, the downside when working with older adults is that some of our studies, participants can actually live in our modules for up to four weeks and, and we're able to kind of just con conduct the experiments, but that's not always conducive for an older adult. They might either physically or for other reasons not be able to stay in an environment like that. Um, so what we try and do in the lab is really learn from what we've done already with younger adults, older adults that are able to be in the lab and take those findings and then translate that into the community. So if we're running a study looking at sleep quality and we're finding that certain lights or certain behaviors that we're noticing um, are kind of useful to look at, we will then take whether it's, let's say, a smartwatch or some other sensor that monitors sleep and we'll take that into the community, into senior living facilities, if we also want to look at, at sleep. That's just kind of one example. Um, so it's, it's really helpful to, to take what we are learning in the lab and then look at how that relates to the findings in the community. Um, but one thing, even though our lab really looks like a real lab, the one thing it's lacking is it's, it's not in the comforts of one's own home. So you're still in a new environment. And so when looking at how older adults are behaving or and whether are they physically active or are they more sedentary, it's harder to really gauge that if we were to conduct a study in the lab. But if we do that on in the on site in their in their home residences, that allows us to really get that really kind of it's data that's very much naturalistic and we can whatever claims we can make out of it um, are really kind of representative of, of what they were doing in their own environment. And Rick, you had mentioned that there's uh, at least one facility in Sauer's portfolio that is used as a living lab. Can you talk about how you chose or how that place was chosen and, and maybe what kinds of things takes place there? Sure. Well, it was really just fortuitous to try where they're located. So um, we just happened okay. to have a facility there and, um, and we had plenty of excess space frankly, because of the pandemic and the impact on occupancy and things like that. So, um, so it was frankly an easy decision for us to essentially turn it over uh, to Delos for this purpose. Um, and, um, and so everything ha is happening in real time, um, which is just invaluable, I think, um, as Delos would say, from a data collection perspective. And I think also from our perspective as a REIT to actually have one of our facilities that's being utilized in this way as a lab um, is going to allow us to pre prevent, present much better data in a way that we think will be extremely convincing to our other operators to start investing in this. And we will partner with them on investing because at the end of the day, we're a capital partner um, to our operators. And um, we have an operator conference. Uh, the next one is going to be next June. We have um, the majority of our operators uh, are represented at that conference. And so we've got a period of time here um, where this program can proceed and data can be collected. And we'll have some real results to talk about when we get to that conference. And um, but we haven't had details together. Dallas will, will be there um, as well. And, um, uh, and I think that will be a really amazing opportunity. Um, for many of our operators to ask questions, to see the results, and to really commit with our help um, to improving um, the quality of life um, with air quality as well as other things um, in their facilities as well. 
Okay. Um, here's can, a question for Peter and Greg. Oh, go ahead. No, please do. Sorry. Oh, I apologize. I just wanted to quickly elaborate a little bit yeah. on that on that study. So our, our lab has really done a lot of fantastic research on air quality and really not with human participants, but just modeling how air moves in a, in a classroom or in an office space or in a conference room. Um, but the one thing that we're unable to do is truly really see what does this look like if we actually go out into a real facility and how does that change? And so um, the, the study that, that Rick is referring to is really allowing us to kind of take what we've learned in the lab and look at how does kind of airborne transmission move around uh, within a room that a resident might be in or across from the room and how does it affect someone if they're kind of coming in at the out of the room if that's the employee and so it's it's vital information that we really need to kind of understand how that's working just to make better decisions on on really how airborne disease and air quality affects older adults in, in such facilities. Thanks. Kevin, it may be worth yeah, so, uh, for the audience to expand a bit on the, when you say building on the foundation of what we already know, uh, maybe just a reference to the studies in other environments, uh, like classroom environments that, that gave us a head start as it relates to us, as it related to us shaping the research agenda for senior. Absolutely. Um, so the, I believe this was just within the last year, what we had done is we converted one of our modules that's usually an office module into a classroom. Um, and there were no students there. It was really just designed that way. But the, really the goal was to really understand how is um, how would airborne viruses like COVID move around in a classroom if somebody was sick? And then what mitigation approaches could actually be done to, to remove that? So whether it's placing uh, portable air purification units strategically throughout the room to really understand how that would be able to kind of mitigate any sort of virus transmission, um, while also looking at different features of the, the built-in HVAC system. And so we learned a ton from those studies that this then allows us to take it so that it doesn't necessarily need to be COVID specific. There's several viruses that are airborne that are moving around, but really understanding what can be done in a senior living facility to also try and provide kind of the best mitigating approach to, to, to reducing that risk of, of, of virus transmission. Thank you. And so this question is for Peter and Rick. Um, we've been talking about health benefits for older adults, um, but should we expect to see the same benefits from improving indoor environments for younger people, such as senior living employees? We, we did touch on this a little bit, um, but wondering if this could be a return on investment for owners and operators too, right? Uh, maybe we can start with Rick and then go to Peter after that. Sure. Um, so I, I think we've, we've gotten a lot better over the years at um, addressing the needs of our patients and residents from a holistic perspective. We've done a horrible job looking at our staff from a holistic perspective, um, in my opinion. So, um, so this is really where the opportunity is for this. And it's less about return on investment because it's so qualitative. And yes, there will be some return on investment because it should improve retention and all that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's really so much more than that because of the interaction between, as I said earlier, staff and patients and residents. So um, looking at the staff members from a holistic perspective, so it isn't just about wages, it's about wages, it's about culture, it's about the value they bring every day and the, and how, how do they feel about the value they bring every day. and. Um, by doing things that affect the physical, to improve the physical environment for them, not just some of the other things I noted, that imparts to them how much value we all see in them um, and should be reflected in the value that they feel like they bring to the job every day. Um, but it's a mission-driven business. And so despite even horrible circumstances over the past two and a half years and, um, and the fact that um, wage issues have been there forever. Um, they come to work and they care deeply. So you've got a base there that probably doesn't exist in a lot of other businesses. And if you can be a lot more proactive in, in treating them holistically and looking at how you can improve 
the environment that they're in and, and the value that they feel like they bring every day. And um, whatever the return is, it's fine. Um, it, it's just more about having um, a very different experience for them um, in our facilities than they've had historically. And Peter? Yeah, certainly. Um, Rick covered that very well. Um, you know, maybe I can offer just a, a couple of insights as it relates to, look, we know the employee shortage uh, issue is a problem and, and uh, you know, great work you guys are doing at McKnight. You've, you've been following this issue as well. Uh, a recent survey uh, by the National Investment Center for Senior Housing and Care said 86% of executives in senior living reported severe or moderate staff shortages, right? And a follow-up survey by the same organization found that half of those executives did not expect any improvement until 2024. So, so there's strain on the system at a time when these folks are desperately, need, desperately needed to support the, the largest senior population in, in history. Um, so creating a safer and better work environment could certainly help uh, attract and retain employees uh, on top of all of the health benefits and reduction of stress, increased productivity. Uh, and that's why we see that these, this goes hand in hand. The indoor environment is populated by occupants and residents, and uh, of course, staff and caregivers. And, and we think that it can make a big difference. Okay. And um, to Peter, uh, if I'm a resident or a resident's family member, what should I ask for or expect regarding indoor environmental quality when I'm considering moving to a specific place? And how should senior living communities and nursing homes be thinking about being evaluated in this way? Thank you. Um, you know, there are some, some real obvious and measurable ones uh, in the buckets of air quality and water quality, you know, whether it's upgrades to the HVAC system or portable air purification units, you know, present in common areas and in resident rooms to create a healthier, safe environment. Um, water, same idea, right? You, you want to purify as much as possible. So water filtration uh, is something that is easily identifiable. It's well understood in the marketplace, and it's just a question of whether there's been focus or not on that. So I would certainly lean towards air and water as, 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 a, as a foundation. But enhanced lighting, you know, while this is not necessarily a baseline for, for all assets, the, the profound impacts that light have on things that are related to the full population, right? Productivity, sleep quality, energy levels, um, digestion, and so on and so forth. Um, extend even further in the senior living community when it gets down to, to things like uh, onset of Alzheimer's and dementia score and things like that, right? So mental acuity and lighting are linked. Um, fact, that's science telling us that they are linked. So I think that, you know, any focus on the, the quality of light indoors is, is a big one. Um, sound, you know, masking attempts to, to make sure that the ambient sound levels are not too high because we know what that does for stress indicators. So so acoustics, um, connectivity to nature, uh, even programming, things like activity calendars. I mean, all of that is beneficial, but I, I, would, I, would, I would probably look in that order. Um, and there are so many other things that can be done, uh, but uh, you know, I wanted to keep it limited to, to the focus on things that are identifiable, that can be implemented uh, at reasonable or low cost uh, and ways that can enhance that, that, that experience for residents. Uh, our Delos Labs team conducted a consumer insight survey last year on this point about indoor air quality and senior living. 62% uh, of a substantive set of participants, okay, said that COVID-19 made them more aware of the importance of good indoor ventilation and air filtration, compared with 29% of those respondents who said that they always felt that way or that they always felt that air was important. So a meaningful jump in the heightened awareness. Um, and interestingly enough, 46% of respondents indicated that air purification measures were important factors or even necessity. And 63% of them said that they would likely choose one facility over another based on prioritization of air purification. Um, so it was a big sample set as it relates to the survey. I think our instincts told us that that was the case, but we wanted to see what the data showed us. And these numbers are significant when you consider the size of the population entering into the sector um, at, at this point. Um, so Rick, do you have any thoughts that, on how? Uh, yeah, let me, let me just add, take a minute to add to that. Um, so one of the things that came out of the pandemic was the issue of safety. 
safety becoming much more important as a factor in the decision making of people to enter facilities. And in a safety way, a lot of folks think about it is just safety in terms of from disease or uh, just safety from, from an illness perspective. Um, but everything that Peter's talked about is falls into that bucket of safety as well. And um, a, a lot of the folks who come to visit facilities don't always know how to ask those questions or the right questions to ask. And so I think for those operators that are prioritizing this and are willing to make these investments, that um, proactively as people come in and sit down with them and do tours and ask questions, the operators should be presenting all of this information to them. They should also be presenting this information to all their referral partners, to other post-acute uh, centers that they may have referrals back and forth from, certainly to acute hospitals. Um, and, um, and it will be a way for those operators to differentiate um, themselves, um, as, as Peter noted. But it's got to be proactive. Um, you can't assume that people are going to come in and just know the right questions. Um, to ask and you've got to deal with safety uh, from a much broader perspective than just uh, the physical aspect. Thank you. It's been a great discussion so far and we want to make sure we have some time for questions and answers. So I just want to remind everyone that if you do have a question about anything we've discussed, uh, please feel free to type it into the questions and answers tab on the left and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the remaining minutes. Um, I have a question while um, before we start uh, questions from those uh, attending. For everyone on the panel, um, if there's one thing you'd like attendees to take away from today's discussion, what would it be? And uh, let me start with Peter. Excellent. Um, you know, I will point to the um, the cost effectiveness of some of these interventions. I mean, in, you know, we, we know that we're, we're trying to inspire informed decisions in that regard, but you know, consistently we've been so influenced by the fact that a lot of this stuff is doable. Um, it's not very, very expensive. I know when you hear, you know, indoor wellness innovation in, interventions or air quality, uh, you know, you think, okay, expensive engineering upgrade and things like that, that it does not have to be the case. And, and we have shaped our research agenda to make sure that we can focus on actionable conclusions uh, that are not just for the luxury sector, uh, that can be implemented in new buildings, existing buildings, uh, whether or not you can get into the ceiling with labor or have people visiting the property. Um, we've been super impressed and excited and encouraged by the fact that there are so many things that can be done that are not nearly as expensive as folks may think they are uh, or challenging to implement. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a good sign of uh, and a constructive view on, on, on how much progress the industry can continue to make here. And Dr. Mazurik? Yeah, I think from the kind of the research perspective, what's really fascinating is that there's a there's a Lancet commission that's really looked at all of these different features that and, and factors that can be attributed to development of dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and I think they've put it at about 40% of them are modifiable that just through certain behaviors, um, if people can address them, they can lead to healthier outcomes that can at least kind of delay or, or not remove completely, but um, just kind of uh, affect the onset of dementia. And so there are some factors like genetics can't really do much about, um, but certain things like trying to promote older adults to be more active, to eat healthier, to stay socially involved and engaged, stay mentally active. These are all things that if done continuously as people age can just lead to just healthier health outcomes and a healthier aging process as um, as as we get older. Um, and so it's kind of a it's interesting to see that from the aspect of the indoor environment, there potentially are things that really could be done that, as Peter said, they might not be very expensive. They might just not require needing this fancy new building, but just slight modifications and it might encourage both residents and it might be helpful to employees too, to just have just healthier behaviors and lifestyles while in these buildings. I think that is kind of a, a very fascinating and interesting um, thing to, to come away with. Thank you. And Rick? Yeah, so I think for me, it's broadening the understanding and perspective that all of our constituents have 
relative to what makes a safe and positive environment for residents and for patients and for the staff. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question from uh, an attendee uh, for you, Rick, about um, the facility that's being used as a living lab. Um, is it otherwise occupied with residents and what type of uh, facility is it? Is it a senior living or skilled nursing? Sure. Um, and can you share how many people live there? Um, it's a skilled nursing facility and it is currently occupied. Um, and I don't know, I haven't looked at the actual occupancy in the last couple of weeks, but it was probably 50 to 60% occupied, something like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And a question for Dr. Mazurik. Um, how does biophilic design play into the initiative? Are there, is there an emphasis on living indoor plants? Yeah, so we have done quite a bit of research into looking at what biophilic design and biophilia can do um, from office workers' perspectives to also looking at kind of burnout and stress reduction techniques using um, concepts of biophilia. So we have done studies where we've looked at just how the presence of real versus artificial uh, plants, um, natural sounds, and what we found is that real plants are helpful, um, but artificial plants still have an effect. So the plant behind me is not real, but it still is doing something for me. Um, and in addition, it, it just has been shown to just reduce stress. So we've seen people just feel more calm when they're in these types of environments. So um, we're looking at studies really trying to see how these kind of aspects of nature can be brought into whether it's rooms that are designed to reduce stress for workers or whether it's to, to improve kind of recovery after a stressful event, um, and even long-term use of trying to see if you're chronically exposed to elements of nature, what might that do to kind of help alleviate or mitigate sort of adverse effects of, of long-term stress or even burnout amongst um, clinicians because the clinicians and the, the healthcare industry burnout is the highest compared to all other professions. And so there's no gold standard for trying to mitigate that, but looking into how elements of nature might be able to kind of create an environment that might alleviate some of those effects is, is something that we're actively looking into. Okay. And here's a question. Several of our facilities don't have HVAC systems. We're in Hawaii. Uh, there are open doors and windows for ventilation. Are portable air filters or purifiers the best way to improve indoor air quality? Uh, I'll jump in and take that one. So great question, great question. Uh, and there's good news on the answer. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, there are some instances, many instances, uh, where portable air units placed throughout the room have um, a more profound and beneficial outcome than whatever you can do in the in the HVAC or in the ceiling. Um, if you can localize the filtration of the air, okay, so by that I mean bring the points of filtration closer to where people are convening, as opposed to air having to travel 18 feet to the top right corner of a room, get in the vent, get recirculated, and then, of course, get redistributed throughout the room. There's a lot of contamination that can happen along the way. So, so putting localized, portable, wall-mounted, or wheeled-in air purifiers closer to where people are convening, we believe, has a scientific benefit. The good news on that is it's oftentimes a lot less intrusive and certainly less expensive uh, to follow that route. So for the folks in Hawaii and, and for any facility in the world, uh, we would highly recommend that, that you consider portable air filtration and, and do not consider that to be secondary or not as effective as, as an HVAC upgrade. Um, from an energy consumption perspective, uh, we believe it's better. But most importantly, the science is telling us that that localization component actually improves uh, the effectiveness of filtration in many environments. So um, those are not expensive devices. The key is to choose the right ones. Uh, and that's where it's important to validate the claims that manufacturers are making. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Mazurk, are, are you doing any research that compares um, long-term care settings, say uh, assisted living or independent living versus skilled nursing? And if so, are there um, differences there 
that you've noted? So that's a, that's a good question. It's not something that we are actively doing right now, but it's definitely on our roadmap to really try and understand how do even just different facilities, even if they are the same, let's say they're all skilled nursing, not everyone is created equally, really just depending on the geography. So really trying to understand how can what we're doing kind of scale up and how do these different findings, what's the commonality that we're finding versus what might be kind of regionalized where it might be informative as kind of the earlier question was if you're in Hawaii and it's different than probably the HVAC that's up here in Minnesota, you, you want to know that and try and understand how these findings actually translate across the board. So it's not something that we're actively doing at the moment, but it's it's on our on our near term uh, roadmap. Thank you. Another question, the current WISE research efforts focus on the effects of lighting and indoor air quality. Does WISE plan to expand to other health and wellness issues in the future? I'll take that. Um, yeah, we've made a commitment to this to this sector to help innovate, to help validate innovations and then drive informed decisions. Um, naturally, the focus was in the highest area of public concern, which is air quality. Uh, we believe that there are immense opportunities to improve health outcomes um, with with lighting. Um, and our intention is to expand that research agenda and continue to focus on other categories, other wellness categories and interventions that can, you know, assist in, 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 in driving positive outcomes. Um, we know from about 12 years of work in the convergence of the health sciences with the building sciences, we know that there's a plethora of subjects to examine. Uh, and we are looking forward to continuing with our commitment to this sector uh, to, to not only innovate, but to, to help validate innovations and again, drive those decisions that are informed by data and informed by science. And one of those one of those areas is staff, yeah one of those areas is staff burnout so that's on the roadmap yeah um, as well yeah a little bit further down the line and that's critical to everybody listening to this I know so <laughs> thank you are there going to be any studies regarding how certain wellness initiative initiatives may affect senior living employee retention speaking of uh, staff wellness uh, and employee satisfaction yeah. employee health uh, rick you mentioned that there will be can we talk a little bit more about about those studies well we haven't start we haven't started them yet but um i think mm -hmm. we we want to look at all those things when you're looking at staff burnout what are the you know, you're going to do a root cause analysis. What are the things that you can do to improve it? What are the benefits from that, that would come from that? So we're a little bit of ways away from doing that, but it's going to be, I think, all encompassing in terms of addressing that issue. Is that fair, Peter? That's absolutely fair. And I'd, I'd follow that with the point that mindful wellness um, is, is a pillar category for us. Uh, air, water, light, sound mind <laughs> sleep right and so burnout and retention and all of that stuff would certainly fall into a category that would benefit from interventions that focus on stress reduction burnout reduction mindful wellness uh and uh, we're looking forward to examining the whole suite of of potential opportunities you know that's one of the things we do as an organization is comb the industry for the best technology best interventions test that technology to make sure that the claims are real and right and accurate and then go beyond and further and do that in simulated real world environments where we can actually test real world outcomes. And so mindful wellness is a huge category. We're committed to that as well uh, and looking forward to extending that benefit to, to what we can do for staff. Um, this is when it really starts turning into measurable ROI. Um, so we've underpinned everything we do on the research side with trying to, to make sure that the conclusions really are very practical. Not only are the interventions implementable, but that they're measurable. Uh, and, and measuring that success is, is obviously important. Uh, but to your point, we're, we're, we're very focused on that category of mindful wellness. Will the findings from these studies be made public or will they be proprietary and only available to members of WISE? Uh, I'll take that question as well. So, so we have had um, you know, a number of different publications come out of the Well Living Lab, uh, studies that have been peer reviewed and published in scientific journals. And you know, our, our mission is to, the inf to, to inform the industry. Um, certainly there's access to members of WISE or 
for the Well Living Lab Alliance and otherwise that they can see, you know, ongoing and real time results and things like that. But but the intent here is to share the information. Um, this is not, you know, something that's been being done for proprietary commercial purposes, but rather to inform and advance the industry, uh, which is why, you know, during this call, like I commended Sabra and of course, you know, others in Wise, Harrison Street, et cetera. I mean, these are these are leadership organizations taking steps to educate the industry, to inform the industry. Uh, and, and that is uh, something that is desperately needed at this point. So I do want to reiterate our appreciation for the industry players uh, to participate here, because that's really what's making the difference. Speaking of industry players, if a senior living operator is interested in becoming involved with the WISE initiative, uh, how can they do that? They can certainly reach out to us, uh, Kevin or myself. Uh, we would love to have a dialogue and engage in that conversation. I mean, obviously, we'll 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 keep you know mindful eye on on capacity and and any boundaries that might you know force us to create a a queue, if you will. But we're interested, mm -hmm. uh, and we'd love to have the conversation. We'd love to be helpful in that regard. Okay. And if a senior living community or operator is interested in focusing on wellness um, more in general, what would be a good first step? Um, we can start with anyone who would like to answer. Uh, maybe I'll jump in on that one as well. I think that I think the literature is is important. Uh, how, how much research is out there uh, already to, to, to get people to understand in layman's terms, the terms, the the effect of of healthy indoor environments or the, the environment has on the human body. Um, as a resource, um, there is uh, a platform called Well um, that is administered by our subsidiary, the International Wellbuilding Institute, that actually certifies and rates spaces for health and health safety. Uh, and there's just an encyclopedia of information that's in the public domain and wildly accessible as it relates to why is air important? What does air do to the body? What does is, what is water do? You know, how does lighting affect sleeping patterns? All, all of that stuff is digestible and, and can be read. And I think there's a mountain of resources that we'd be happy to provide in that regard that, again, are out there for public consumption uh, to help advance the, the convergence of, of really the wellness industry with the real estate industry. That's what's happening. And if I can Before our hours up, I want. Briefly. Oh, go Sorry. ahead. I, I sure, just no, please to add do. One quick thing to that is, um, it's also learning from both the residences and the employees of the facility because every facility is different. And so, by going on to the site that Peter had mentioned, but then truly just getting a a, a real pulse on what residents are feeling and whether they I mean, even if it's a simple question of how do you feel your do you notice anything about the air quality here versus where you moved in from something like that just really learning from everyone who's there on a day-to-day -day basis is also crucially helpful in trying to make decisions like this thank you um before hours up i wondered if anyone wanted to share any final thoughts um we could start with uh rick do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with people watching today? Yeah, sure. I would just say, you know, listening to some of Dr. Mazurik's answers, I hope everybody, one of the takeaways is that nothing's being, nothing's blueprinted here, which is one of the things that really attracted us. We've heard him say sort of time and again over the course of this webinar that not every facility is the same. Um, not every residence is the same. Geography makes a difference. And so um, that was one of the, one of the, number of things that was so attractive to us about um, about this partnership was the understanding about the uniqueness of what we do in every single location and um and i, I really appreciate this partnership more than i can say and um, i hope this webinar shows everybody why we we're so excited about doing this and i really want to thank peter and dr mazur for um, everything they're doing and uh, Dr. Mazurk, do you have any final thoughts? I, I thank for those very kind words. Um, it is, it's something that I've really learned is that uh, there is no gold standard where here's the solution for everybody. It just it, it doesn't really exist in anything. Um, but I think the, the really, I sort of mentioned it earlier, but the key takeaway is that there are certain things and it might not be universal, but that can just be done to really promote the health and well-being of both residences and employees. Um, and they aren't astronomically expensive, um, but if they can get people kind of up and moving and 
walking and sleeping better. Um, those are all just great things to strive for, just to, to improve everyone's kind of health and wellness as, throughout the aging process. And Peter, any final words? Sure, I might just jump in and reiterate that, um, as Rick said, you know, through every crisis, you look for opportunities uh, to, 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 to improve outcomes. And we have a real shot here. The world is focused on the effect the indoor environment has on, on human health and well-being as a result of the pandemic. Um, and, and it's not just air quality. Um, I think in the future, there will be a time when we look back and say, remember when dialogue surrounding health and wellness versus dialogue surrounding architecture, engineering, design, programming operations weren't linked. You know, do you remember when, you know, we were doing the research to help inspire and continue to drive that um, that convergence. Uh, so uh, we look at this as a tremendous opportunity uh, with a, a lot of momentum at this point, And I think a lot of good can come out of that. So we're very excited to continue to push forward. So thank you, everyone. We hope those attending have found today's forum and this webinar helpful. This session will be available shortly to listen to again online at mcknights.com slash 071922 online forum. Please feel free to share that address with colleagues who would be interested in this topic. We'd like to give special thanks to our panelists, Peter Shala, Rick Matros, and Kevin Mazurik for being with us today to share their insights and experiences. And thanks to our sponsor, Delos. You can visit delos.com to learn more about the company. This is Lois Bowers, editor of McKnight Senior Living. On behalf of everyone at McKnight Senior Living, McKnight's Long-Term Care News, and McKnight's Home Care, I'd like to thank you for attending.